Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for uh, coming coming down to, down to this uh, meeting. Um, we're we're gonna uh, talk about you know it's great to have Jim here from California. Uh, his, it's his Thanksgiving um, tomorrow, so you know he's he, he's been gracious enough to do this uh, tonight. So that's quite nice of him. Um, what we're gonna talk about is um, Vita Dynamic, and Vita Dynamic is quite uh, an interesting product. Um, I believe I, I don't believe it get, gets as much um, interest or clout on the dental market as it should. Um, you know, like we we you know obviously Emerald Dental Works sells the product, but you know we we test the products that we sell, and I you know I, I believe it or not I test every product that 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 we we try in the lab as many as possible, and. Um, and I had a Vita Dynamic used for uh, an inlay, and I I ha have to admit I was surprised on the chameleon effect of the of the product. So I was quite excited about that. The um, the lecture of the course is implant restorative materials from a high aesthetic to heavy load situations. And um, with this heavy load situations, I think that's the uniqueness of this product. And um, I do. I just asked Jim if he'd be kind enough to share a little slide presentation of this product co called InnovaBite. And InnovaBite is um, from Cube Innovations in Montreal, based in Montreal. They, they thought this out in Montreal. Frederic, Frederic Marcel, he's the um, president, CEO, the, the guy who, who, who thought this whole project out. And I, I met him like a year, two years ago. And then I, I I ran into him again at uh, Spectrum Toronto, and then I ran into him again at uh, Dr. Barsley's um, potpourri uh, presentations. And um, the more I, I I listen to him, and the more I think of this product, it it makes sense. At first I said, ah, oh, it's a clencher thing, you know, you, no need to measure it. But um, when he measures it out in in Newton's forces and that, and and um, he he was kind enough to send me a brief. Um, presentation. So um, I'll be quiet. I'll just say thank you for joining us. And Jim, if you could play the presentation now, and I'll mute myself. And then uh, right. once the presentation's done, we'll I'll, I'll I'll come back on. Okay, Jim. Okay. Okay, we can't hear it, Jim. Sorry, Mark. All of a sudden, now it doesn't want to okay. make a sound. But we'll get it. We'll get it squared away. Okay. So, so what I asked Jim to do is, if this was the last minute thing, so um, you know, Jim could have easily said no, Mark. Uh, you know, this will just screw it up and be. Too much, too much work, but he was kind enough to give it a go. So, you know, we'll, what we're going to do is he's, we couldn't get the the sound from the computer, so he's just going to go over the sound of, of that. Or you know what, Jim? Why don't Why don't I just go I, through it without the? I think I have it. Oh, do you? Okay. Yeah. Actually, actually, Jim, it's pretty muted, so I'll just go through this product. I'll just, I'll it's, just go. You don't hear it? it? No, no. It, it's just if you can mute them, and then I'll just talk about it. So, so this is uh, Innova Byte, and you know, I apologize. Um, this presentation will, we'll have this presentation online for you to take a look afterwards. But um, this is a the first patented device on the market that measures the accuracy of the bite force and design the treatment plans based on the bite force of your patients. It's Health Canada certified first and then the, and then it's US um, Food and Drug Administration certified. What you see here is the blue part is actually the what the patient bites down on 
and it's, and it's it's truly a bite force register. If you see on the so, on the side, you see 475 newtons. Um, that's that's the patient's bite force. Um, if you go to the next slide. So so what we see, yeah, it, you, we can pause them though. There we go. So what we see here is a bite force reference value, and what they did is they took this a reference value of us from a study, and the studies <laughs> written down here, as all studies are written in small small type, so you can't possibly read it on the slide. But what they did with the study is they took, um, I believe it was 700 patients of varying degrees, even uh, patients with dentures, fixed implants, um, worn down dentition, uh, beautiful natural dentition, and they had them um, all do a bite test. And I believe in the bite test, what they did is they have them sitting upright in a chair, they have them clenched down once, open, clenched down twice, open, and then really forced the, the final clench. And the final clench gave them the readings of, of these areas. Normal is 650 to 1,000. Um, uh, at 1,000 plus, you're you're in a destructive zone, basically. And then on the lower end, this is you can um, just kind of think of it with a, a patient with an ill-fitting denture that's um, eating, you know, eating mashed potatoes every night. And so they need something that's more um, upwards to the 400, 650, if not in 650 to 1,000. Go to the next slide. Oh, okay. So this now click it again. So this is this is kind of um, um, talking about you know a patient with with a denture and they're a low um, force and uh, the, with implant supported dentures or reinforced or reline properly fitting denture and occlusion they'll get a better uh, bite force and on the case on the top um, you know it's um, it's a case for um, you know restoring this I don't know where the dental implants come because he's fully he has all his dentition there but if you're building a night guard for this patient and measuring the patient's forces through that night guard and also if you think of a case like this is building the case up even with the Vita temp cad to um, balance out the occlusion to uh, hopefully work on the patient's uh, bite forces and see what what that can happen with the with the a built up occlusion and then go to restore it with you know you know obviously we're talking about this product right now which is Vita Dynamic that has a compression force and Jim will talk about that a lot more go to the next so, slide you know, Mark uh, Mark this is a good example though of uh, where they are uh, wearing down their own natural teeth yeah and you hit it on the head I mean even if they restored it with implants and maybe a fixed denture or not sometimes they have to wear a night guard as well uh, so they don't uh, cause go into that superior Type fracture mode, so yeah. So it's a very nice, very good example of what to look out for. Yeah. And so, um, if you just keep on clicking all through here, you know, this is the this is the Emerald Dental Works uh, infomercial here. So um, we've just um, brought this product on, and um, and you can just contact me if you have any more questions, and um, if you want to try it out and uh, see what this is really all about you just uh, contact me and we'll take it from there okay so um you know and now on with the main show um we, you know tonight uh what we we have jim mcguire jim mcguire's uh he's in he's in california um he's a director of education and clinical affairs and technical support for vita north america uh, Jim brings more than 40 years of experience as a dental technician. He's operated his own dental lab as well as lectured and conducted hands-on dental programs throughout North America. His background also includes works on CAD CAM applications and dig digital workflow of materials. Uh, and I had the pleasure of listening to Jim on a few of his presentations such as this tonight. And um, I contacted Denise right away and asked Denise, um, you know, how can we get Jim uh, to lecture for us? And especially lecture for us for this unique product, which is um, Vita Dynamic. And uh, Jim, 
uh, once again, thank you for uh, being a part of this. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, greatly appreciated. I hope everyone is well out in the wherever you may be. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, implants, treatment planning with implants, and what digitally or non-digitally traditional areas, what can be offered to help alleviate some of those forces that Mark uh, has already addressed. Um, just so that everyone knows, there, everyone is on mute. Uh, so on that right-hand side of the panel, there is a question box. So if you have a question, uh, feel free to go into that question set and just type in your question. We'll try to do most of the Q&A at the end of the uh, program. Uh, but Alvar, I have given uh, Mark permission to introduce, inter, um, um, to um, talk to me uh, whenever you're ready or whenever you have something comes up that you want to uh, that we, maybe we need to elaborate further on or maybe I, I got it wrong. So please use that question box, uh, Q&A at the end. It is going to be recorded. Mark and I are going to work out where that if it's, uh, you know, it's going to be posted. Uh, it's de definitely posted on our Vita Learning website, but uh, through the YouTube. But Mark will also see about downloading that and having it available to everyone to revisit. Almost like wine, right? You can revisit it and have more fun with it. So again, thanks, Mark. Uh, I, everyone knows Vita. They probably know more than anything uh, as far as Vita's with the shade. So the shade itself is uh, something that we try to, uh, you know, make sure that it's consistent throughout whatever the product line that we have or utilize, anywhere from the shade all the way through the materials into the into the consistency of the processing end, and to and to that end. Everything is wrapped up. Everything's tied together. Uh, the shade, of course, is the primary focus of our company. My, most of you know us by the Vita Classical Shade Guide. Some of you are aware that we also have a secondary uh, shade guide. It's called 3D Master. I want to briefly go into it. This classical shade guide, as you can see, uh, you know, it was originally developed back in the 1920s. So. Some of these colors that you use today are the exact same colors, in a sense, that we used back in the 1920s. That was when we didn't do a lot of Cranenbridge. We did more of denture teeth, and then eventually became uh, porcelain fused to metal and so forth, uh, vacuum formed and so and as well. But this is primarily the same shades that we use, except for this bleach area. And, but all these. Uh, Colors are represented in most of the Vita materials, uh, but we also moved over to a what was called 3D master system. And there, one of the reasons we did that is uh, this is a interesting data that uh, Dr. Mike Detola presented was at, at from Glidewell Industries. They actually went back and looked at all the uh, the data of their shades that they received in, and the primary one is uh, was A2. Not that everyone is an A2, but it's just so happens that A2 was around the area in which many of the shades appeared to be visually. So A2 is a prominent shade, uh, but there's a lot of holes. This box here represents the entire area of tooth colors. So we actually did a study and figured out, okay, where specifically is in the color wheel what combination of value chrome and hue consists of the dental shades available. And then we were able to measure each shade tab and plot it into this box. And then left a lot of holes. So the holes themselves were covered up using this new system called 3D Master. If you come across it, uh, you know, if you prescribe it or whether or not you receive it in your laboratory, uh, this is just another way to identify the shade and most of our materials come in either a classic shade or what was called a 3D master shade system. These shades on the 3D master are value based on a value and then they're, they have a hue component and then a chroma or intensity. So like everything else, if you think of it as A1, A2, if you look at those two, the differences, if you want to say that they're both the same, close to the same value, but one A2 has more chroma than the um, A1. 
So that's how we identify A1, A2, A3. They each have a little bit more um, chroma compared to the previous one. The M here just stands for Mandarin Orange. So just like the classical shade system, we do have hue uh, color classifications. We have an L, which is lemonish, uh, M, which is Mandarin Orange, and then, of course, uh, R, which is for Rosa. So most natural teeth go from uh, the yellowish to the reddish, and in between, of course, is the main component, those orangish teeth. Uh, so we've developed it so that it identifies and fulfills those, a lot of those holes. 3D Master is an easy concept. It's just like your classical shade system, uh, your shade guide. You basically take these small shade uh, guides, bring it up to the patient's mouth, of course, parallel to those uh, teeth, and then you find the closest matching shade to have. It kind of drives the um, you, or if you're doing custom shades in your lab, or if you're the dentist or an assistant that is online, um, it kind of drives you to the right shade tab instead of trying to understand, okay, of those 16 classic shades, which one do I use? Oh, well, A2 seems to work all the time, so I'll just go to use A2. But in this case, it actually forces you, like I said, to actually drill down and figure out exactly what the closest shade is and then prescribe that or receive uh, that prescription, again, if you're the laboratory. So this, between the two shade systems, the classic and the 3D master, now this area that represents natural tooth colors, we can kind of fill up the entirety and get rid of a lot of those um, areas that there never was a color representation by the classic. So what I would do is just use, know that there's two shade systems, use them both. If you can't find it in the classic shade system, then move to your 3D master. Between those two systems, you're going to get a close match for shade. Now, I've talked to Mark. We're, we are going to try to put together a, um, a shade uh, program in early uh, 2022, hopefully next, next January or so. Uh, I don't want this to become a, a shade presentation. I just need to uh, address that shades um, are available in different shade systems, different materials that, um, that we have to offer as well. One thing you do need to do though, <clears throat> by doing uh, external glass material by uh, either you receive or you're gonna prescribe, you're gonna indicate a all ceramic restoration. The lab needs from you, if you're a dentist, the lab needs from you really a prep shade. So you need to identify what that prep shade is. And if you are using a material that's more glass, very translucent, you need to take into account that that prep, that canvas is going to show through, possibly through that material and that you choose. So then sometimes, occasionally, you almost have to redesign the canvas by applying either a maybe a zirconia coping, a thimble on it, telescopic coping, I think is what we call them up in Canada, uh, and or mask it out yourself with some opaques uh, that they have on the market. Either way, communicate that to the lab. The lab then, with your help, has a choice of different materials. So this is important also for the lab to understand too, because often we are uh, talking and communicating to uh, both sides between the dentist and the auxiliaries and the laboratory technician and so forth. We're talking about, okay, you want a certain material. However, it's possible that if I use that material, it may not show up the best as the best um, cosmetic uh, outcome. That maybe we need to select a material that might be, uh, have to mask out that prep. Maybe there's not enough room to create a nice aesthetic uh, veneer. And we have to do, maybe move to zirconia, something that masks it out completely. Or we still do this a lot in the US, uh, maybe a PFM. But I think ceramic, all ceramic type, uh, has a deficit as far as translucency opacity. So you try to select an, a, a material 
that's by indication. And, and today, you know, a lot of that indication we're going to talk about today is more towards the implants. However, there's uh, a lot of background to our implant uh, material called Enamic. Uh, it is a digital processed material. And through uh, Emerald, of course, you are going to provide uh, them either with a, uh, an impression, if you're a dentist, an impression or a digital file. Uh, if you're a laboratory, right, you can uh, ask them about any of this technology and the materials that they um, can get you direct. But you need to one way or the other, either if you're doing it yourself or you're prescribing it and you're having a laboratory do it. Uh, the main points are that we can do these by digital machining. Uh, some of the things today we can also do by printing, not there yet with the glass or really long-term uh, denture teeth, uh, but primarily you can take an impression, they may uh, pour it up, and then there would be a file created, an STL file, uh, just a digital file, uh, and then the, the model from a digital file can be created, it can be printed, it can mill, be milled out nowadays, or uh, like I said, it can be poured up in a traditional manner. And then, of course, design. So, you know, part of this may be that you as a laboratory, you're only going to get the materials uh, from Emerald. So, therefore, you're going to do all the design, your scanning, your design, and so forth. On a lab, on a dentist side, though, uh, you have the flexibility to uh, get to a point where you have a, uh, a file or an impression to Emerald in which they can take it from there. But the materials that we are going to go over today, they are milled. They're machinable. We created the first machinable ceramic uh, back in around 1985, released here in the US. It was called Vita Blocks. And this is actually a material that's really Bell's Pathic porcelain. It's no different than a all ceramic uh, porcelain material based on Felspar. Uh, the difference is that since this is uh, created and cured, if you will, or, or fired by the manufacturer, by Vita, it's a very dense material. So there's very little voids to it, or I should say there's practically no voids, no air pockets. So it's much stronger, if you will, than a conventional ceramic porcelain. It, this stuff is so strong that if it's stacked up as far as the loads, in which uh, Mark was talking uh, about earlier, what we want to see is a material that doesn't break any flexural bending um, apparatus because those numbers are more for standards to make sure that a certain material at least meets those ISO requirements. What's important for us is, and it should be for you, is what materials resist fracture. Because we never make a bar and place it as a, a crown. We make a crown, right? We make a restoration. We replace teeth. So if you load this, if you take the same pattern and create, mill out the same, um, in this case, a molar, and you load it, till it until it uh, fails, you're looking pretty much this material, even though the flexural strength may be a little bit less, it is equivalent really to uh, like an Emacs, if you will. So you have a lot of choices. Uh, of different materials that you can have milled out or used for the restorations. This is just another alternative. It's a material, as Mark mentioned, it's a material that is very aesthetic, very cosmetic. And, it's, and as far as survivability, as far as um, the success of it, uh, this thing was launched you know, back in 1985 in the US, uh, but we have we have data from 17 years of uh, molars uh, at a 92% survival rate. So this was originally thought of as the new gold standard for machinables. And so Vita benchmarked all of their other materials that they came later. They benchmarked it against this Mark II or Vita blocks material. It is very much like a chameleon. And once you place it on the prep, it blends into that tooth. So this is a very cosmetic, aesthetic material called Vita Blocks, and they come in different um, styles. They're either a monochromatic called the Mark II or a polychromatic called the Forte. The Forte actually has some transitional 
material just like a natural tooth. So you can see it's fairly close to mimic a natural tooth. And it, uh, it actually um, is, um, is designed to, to wear like natural teeth. So it's a uh, wear kind. This just happens to be the uh, Mark II material and then the enamel. You can see the facet, the pattern, the wear pattern. They're very similar. So using the Mark II, the VitaBlox, the Forte, not only aesthetic, but also very wear kind and just like a natural dentition. So this material with a already built-in polychromatic style can be used for anteriors. It can be used for posteriors. It can be used for anything that you feel is aesthetic, inlays and onlays and so forth. So very aesthetic material, very strong material as far as uh, the um, loads uh, support, fracture resistance, if you will. Uh, but again, it's a very cosmetic uh, material that may be one indication that you're looking for to make it as cosmetic, as aesthetic as possible, and this might fit the bill. Another material that can uh, be worked with on with uh, implants, the, the Vita blocks, of course, can be used for uh, abutment crowns over implants, but so can this Supreme EPC. Uh, this is something that's been out in Canada actually since 2013. This is a, a reinforced zirconia material. It is a lithium silicate. It does transition, so it, it, it is a material that's like amber uh, looking at first, and then it has to be crystallized, but the, um, the lab would do all that processing for you unless you choose to there, uh, but the lab will, uh, will process it, crystallize it, turn it into a tooth color of the given shade. An ideal situation for you, though, whether you're in a laboratory and you're working with the dentist or the dentist, if you're uh, listening, you know, you have the ability to take this material and try it in after it's machined. So if you're thinking that maybe the, my impression that I received from my dentist, might the margins might be off, hey, I don't want to spend all that time to process it, the, on, your, on the dentist side, right, you may think, well, you know, I have a good uh, impression or digital impression. I think I captured everything, but maybe I want to try it in for shape, for size, uh, for that patient. You actually can try these in, check the margin, check the fit, and then check the contour, check the uh, design. Uh, that uh, has been created for you, the contouring and so forth. And then you can go ahead and process it, uh, crystallize it, turn it into a tooth color. This is a good example of using the material to your indication. These are two, if, if you, you can also look at this like these are uh, implant abutments. So you've got two different abutments here that may be discolored differently. So this is the hardest thing for labs to do, especially on centrals, is to have two adjacent centrals that you need to uh, still, uh, at, at the end of the day, come out with a cosmetic and shade match central crowns or restorations, even though the canvas may be different. So depending on the material, that you choose or work with, you may choose a different translucent material for one prep or one abutment versus the other. This could be a situation where the, this is a natural tooth prep and adjacent to it is an implant abutment. And so you have to use different translucencies or opacities to mask out that implant abutment. So you can try this in and eventually you need to, regardless of the materials that are used, the indication is to have a very aesthetic result that fits precisely and that looks natural. And by manipulating different materials and different opacity translucencies, we can do that now with today's modern materials. This is a material suprenity. It's a very strong material as well. Just a, you know, talk a little bit about the market. We're all in, uh, you know, in, in always thinking about, well, how strong is it? How strong is it? That's the number one question we always get. Well, how strong is it? Again, what we're used to for the strength, the conversation really has been around how strong is it under a standard 
a, a bar that is bent and fractures. And that's really what the numbers are market-wise. They report biaxial or three-point bending megapascals, not newtons, but megapascals, which is basically a set specific geometry. In this case, a biaxial is like a disc about the size of a quarter, and it's a certain thickness, and the apparatus just loads it until it fractures, and that's what the uh, strength is. So if you need something that's strong in that application, a non-clinical strength test, uh, Suprendity right now is the highest uh, strength machinable glass material that's on the market today. And you can see by the numbers, it's a little bit stronger than the, the competitor here. So those numbers are great, but again, fracture load is what makes a difference between a lot of these materials. And at the end of the day also, it's about blending in. No matter if you're creating it or you're placing it for your patient, at the end of the day, you wanna play something that kind of just melts into the surrounding dentition and nobody knows that it's a crown. It is a tooth replacement. And so no matter what shade system you use or material selection, eventually you'll get to the point where you can, you can dial in and know, okay, on this particular case, I have this much material thickness, I'm gonna use this material because it best fits for that indication. We're a company that doesn't necessarily like one material fits all. To us, that it doesn't make sense. There are areas in which you need more cosmetic than you do strength. So you don't have to compromise aesthetics by getting something that's strong in a flexural strength um, test. You know, you can have both worlds and make it work for that particular patient. The other thing I want to throw in last minute about shade is just this. If you are working with an older shade guide, you want to make sure that it's um, still the correct color. So the worst thing we can have on a lab is my dentist prescribing A3. I make whatever the material is. I make it A3 out of my laboratory. I send it back to my dentist. And they say, well, this is an A3. I'm looking it up and comparing it to my uh, shade tab, whether it's classical 3D master, and it doesn't look right. Well, if you have an, whether you're a lab or a dentist, if you've got an older version of the shade guide and those tabs, then your, um, then your um, colleague, then you may be, having these colors off only because somebody's looking at the wrong template, somebody's looking at the wrong gold standard. After a while, after these are worn, the, the shade tabs are all porcelain. They're, they are naturally glazed. They can either wear down and or if you disinfect them quite often, after about three years, the disinfectant material will actually start changing the luster or the gloss off the surface, and as soon as we change that gloss, it no longer appears visually the same color. So make sure you're updated with your shade guides and you're on the same page. So what about implants, Jim? Well, implants have a specific need, and that is to create a situation where we alleviate or reduce stresses. So there is a material called enamic. It is not a composite. This is so confused in the, uh, the market. This is not a composite. A composite material has discrete glass particles in a sea of resin, whereas our enamic is actually a beta block structure, and then it's infiltrated in there with a polymer. So you have a homogenous material that is, is reduced individuality so that when stresses occur, the ceramic, like rebar, the ceramic material will take on those loads, resist the fracturing, whereas the polymer actually uh, reduces those loads or that energy, which is what you want to, what, which is what you see in implants when you have a uh, severe um, parafunctional habit. 
this material is a, uh, as I mentioned, it is a Mark II, basically a Mark II material with some polymer in it. Because it's a Mark II material, it's always etched. You do not cement this. This is a bonded material. So this is a material that if you request and you receive, you will need to bond it. Uh, it is milled or can be cut very thinly uh, as far as micro veneering. Uh, it can be cut and milled down to almost about two tenths of a millimeter. This happens to be an anamic and a what we call super translucent that has a, a little bit of light cured stain on it. But this case happened to be the prep. The canvas was such a good prep all, uh, color already that this doesn't need a masking material. This was uh, a clear, pretty much a clear, transparent, enamic, super translucent material that then was bonded with a clear or neutral uh, bonding agent uh, to those natural teeth. And if it's done right, they are fairly seamless as far as the end result. Okay. Now, when we go to implants, so it's a little bit different because you are usually always covering a silver or a metal abutment. And the other thing I want to remind everyone out there, whether or not you're the lab and you're having issues with some of the uh, preps, or if you're a dentist, when it comes to selecting these machinable materials, we have to keep in mind how they are created. Unlike traditional, where we can get away, say, with a, a veneer, in the past we would do either a foil technique or a refractory, and it wasn't too hard to get around undercuts. But when it comes to milling, you want to be able to use the size of burrs that the milling machine can create. If your burr that you use intraorally is too narrow, you're gonna have a very wide space, cement space, after it's milled in the machines because the burr is much larger than what you used in the preparation. So make sure that you understand the concept that the best seeding restoration has a uniform material thickness and a uniform, uh, ad what we call adhesive gap or cement gap. We don't want the machine to owe what we call over mill and have thick areas of bonding agent and or very thin. That's a no-no. So we prep it correctly and everything will go smoothly. We have very uh, thin cross sections with this anamic material because it can be milled so fine. And just to go back to the point of the um, fracture load versus the static load or the loads of a, um, the ISO standard material, this is kind of of the material, the uh, the object, the, the design that's used for ISO standards. This is through a three-point bending test. It's just a bar. It's loaded till it fractures. For enamic, for those of you who are asking, well, how strong is it? How strong is it? This enamic in this standard only, this test standard, is 150 to 160 megapascals. But what does that mean clinically? It means absolutely nothing. If you look at a competitor, a material, one day overnight, it jumped from 360 to 500. How did that work? Well, I told, mentioned it earlier. It was a type of testing. It was moved and marketed from a three-point bending test that came out about 360 to 380 megapascals. And by changing the type of um, configuration of the sample tested or loaded to a disc, now you've got more surface area and it takes more weight or more load to actually cause that to fracture. So it's, it's a game sometimes on the marketing side. Again, what we're concerned about, what VITA makes sure of is that once it is milled out to a restoration, the design of a restoration, we want to make sure that the fracture load is as high as it can get. So you can see here, uh, enamic, it's very high. It 
these are newtons here, right? And Mark was talking about a thousand as being severe for um, you know a bruxer once you get into parafunctional habits. A thousand newtons is a, a critical point. Bruxers are around two thousand. So you can see here that uh, this anamic material is close to three thousand newtons. So it's very it satisfies the requirement of a very um, heavy biting patient, especially when it comes to implants. So this is uh, something that you can uh, be very um, uh, well aware of that as far as uh, uh, aesthetics, but also the strength of it is adequate to, uh, to do this. Uh, one of the features of this, one of the primary reasons why it's such a high fracture load is because when this material, this anamic, is loaded by the patient, if it goes into a severe parafunction or um, you know the the loads are such that the patient is is chewing a bone or or a glass or whatever they are, this material, as opposed to fracturing, will actually um, bend. It will distort. It will deform before it fractures. That ceramic will resist the fracture. The polymer actually absorbs the loads and those that energy that's created by that patient, heavy uh, biting patient, they're absorbed into the material and that energy is, um, is just uh, dissipates. So we wanna have the material that works the best uh, for the situation, right? So when it comes to dental implants, one of our primary concerns is to avoid overloading. That's one of the leading causes, if not the soft tissue end of it, but overloading will cause severe damage to that implant uh, prosthetic abutment uh, interface. It'll cause soft tissue and hard tissue to die back because of the stress. So if you look at the literature, Almost all of the literature to date really talks about how do we uh, manipulate the rest restorative materials properties to try to alleviate or reduce the stress to that implant for long-term success. And really the criteria comes down to, uh, you know, use a material and an approach that minimizes that stress. We know that this happens to be on dentures, but we do know also on implant crowns that once the patient is placed and they are loaded, at first they do not um, have a lot of, uh, let's say, um, uh, appreciation for biting. They can't feel the implants. They can't feel how, how uh, hard they are biting, um, especially for denture implants. But after the implants are healed, after the patient gets more comfortable, they start loading themselves more with uh, you know, a heavier biting uh, functionality as time goes on. So it can ramp up even on a denture, you know, 50 to all the way up to a 200 newtons. If it's a fixed denture, right, you're looking at uh, well over a thousand newtons. So we know that as time goes on, there's more loads. And so the consensus on most all this literature is that there's an advantage to use a material that is shock absorbing. And that's what anamic really does, because if you compare it to different options, some material options, and there are other options. You know, I'm not saying that you only have to use enamic. I'm only trying to explain how enamic may help that patient and yourself for long-term success. But you have, compared to the uh, uh, hybrid ceramic like enamic that absorbs forces, you've got these other glass materials or even a zirconium material. But if you look at those materials as well, uh, they have different stress properties. They absorb different um, or transmit uh, different loads through the material. And if you compare Vita Anamic, we're about 70% less force absorbent or, or more force absorbent than we are to zirconia. Zirconia is a very hard material. So a static implant that does not move when the patient chooses, if we're talking about single or multiple single implants or even a bridge-borne implant case, those implants do not give. We do not have secondary tooth movement. The adjacent teeth, if there are natural dentition, those move. They kind of will sink secondary tooth movement, and then the implants are loaded directly. 
you want to reduce that stress. So if you move from a zirconia, which we think is a, a go-to for everything because we think it's so strong, a material like zirconia may be too strong as far as the modulus goes. It, it is not a very force absorbent material. Uh, a lithium silicate, the same thing, is that once you get to a very hard glass, uh, it, you know, it may be less force absorbent than you are with the, even gold. And we know that gold is a gold standard for a reason. It's a very soft long-term material. So the dynamic though fits in nicely. The data supports this. This is why the uh, enamic can be used for an implant crown. Uh, different abutments, the, you know, you have a choice of going to all different types of implant systems, making custom abutments or, or um, you know, going to brand X, brand Y as far as the implant uh, manufacturer, and then also to go to screw retain or cement retain restorations. But the crown itself, there is restorative material. Uh, you want something that's going to absorb those uh, masticatory forces and reduce those. So if we benchmark around 1,000 newtons, this thing is pretty close to what that is in that testing on an implant, which is static. So as I mentioned, we can go screw retain, we can go uh, cement retain. This all comes down to really treatment planning. And part of that treatment planning is shade. What a material is best for that implant, but also what type of implant material. A zirconia is very white, and then you have to mask that out. If you've seen this or have done this case before where you have a white zirconia abutment or even a gray abutment, and then you've got to put a zirconia on top of it, you want to move away from that white out, that shade that's very difficult to hide or to mask. So the enamic comes in a tooth color. It already can mask that uh, tie abutment, tie base, the abutment, the custom abutment, and then all we have to do is bond it. So shading is an issue. We also have micro leakage, right? We have uh, a material that is finely um, uh, milled to very precise precision. One of the other reasons we have implant, implant uh, implantitis and so forth is that we, if we have a micro gap, that is collecting bacteria, food, and so forth, high, hard to clean, uh, that will then maybe cause a dieback of soft and hard tissues. So we look at a dynamic, it's cut very thin. It can be all the way down to the margin, the, the collar of the margin. Um, we just use an adhesive to do that, to bond it to this uh, abutment. We can either use a custom abutment, a stock abutment. It doesn't really matter the abutment shape and size as long as it's uh, still uh, conducive to what implants are as far as the height and so forth, uh, the strength of the titanium. And those are parameters that we always have to treatment plan uh, to decide on what implant case, what size implant, what type of restorative material, is there an angle, can I do screw retain, can I do cement retain, and so forth. They each have different criteria. If you want to do a cement retain, no problem with enamic. You can actually make a primary abutment made out of enamic, and then on top of that, you can do any other glass material on it because the implant abutment, that symbol, that um, uh, abutment material made out of enamic will still absorb a lot of those stresses. Uh, but there's requirements, right? You have to have enough height for um, uh, cement. Uh, you also then have to have the implant placed correctly. Uh, it hides screw uh, the screw access channel. You know, if it's not treatment plan correctly, if you go, to, sometimes you have to go to a screw routine. Uh, and sometimes cosmetic, cosmetically, if the implant is placed well, then you can do pretty much either cement retain or screw retain. It's just that when you get to a point where uh, this is iffy, right? If you're under a stamping cusp uh, and you have your, some, your screw access hole right there, that axis is going to create more uh, forces distributed down. And you can also see that there's a wear on your composite that you've patched up. So you need to make sure and treatment plan correctly, cement retained or screw retained accordingly.
Now, if you are going to get into implants and you're going to restore them, the good thing is, is that uh, if you get it from the um, laboratory or emerald and so forth, a lot of this stuff may be done by the laboratory. However, you may be also forced to do it if you're the dentist uh, online here watching this uh, webinar. Either way, the process is simple. It may look confusing. There's a lot of steps. But if it's done properly, it's done properly. And because we want to make sure that the crown itself, when you go to cement it or bond it to your abutment, we create an index so that the crown, after we put a bunch of glue in there, that you position it over that abutment in the right position. So we just do that, we mark it up, we place it on like a replica analog, however you want to call that. We then cover up the chimney, we sandblast it. Once it's sandblasted and textured, we're going to come back and we are going to use a um, uh, like a monobond plus or uh, any other primer type material. So we sandblast it, we clean it, we in a sense silenate it um, using a, uh, a primer. And then we take the restorative material, whether it's cement retained, the top row here is all cement retained, this is the process for screw retained, but the abutment, whether it's an abutment for a cement retained or a screw retained crown, we have to etch the enamel or any other material you're going to use. It, it's always etched, it's rinsed out, and then you use a silane. Once you're past that step, you know, you want to make sure that you don't over etch your material. Using a material called ceramics etch, it's only 5%. A lot of offices are going to use 7, 8, 9%. And if you do, which is fine, then you just need to make sure that you only reduce that etching time to about 20 seconds because you don't want to over etch it because your etch pattern, the surface that's left, you don't want it to crumble and fall off with the crown. So etch it properly. It's very important to, to etch properly the right amount of time. And then we use, you know, this is one of the few things that we actually like uh, about our friends, colleagues over at the, Ivy Clark, they have a nice uh, called multi-link hybrid abutment cement. Uh, after you've sandblasted it, you've etched your crown, your restorative abutment, um, you've primed it. Now you come back and you need to load the abutment, whether it's custom abutment or a preformed one. You now use that uh, hybrid abutment material and you go ahead and cement your crown or your abutment onto that post. And then you just clean it up. All right, so you got to remember, we made that mark for a reason. We have to position that crown onto the implant abutment correctly. So we always try to put a, uh, from the lab side, we always try to put some kind of a groove or some kind of an index on that abutment to position it um, correctly onto the implant, but also so that we orient the crown onto the abutment properly. And if you don't see that, then go ahead and make your own mark. Make sure it's done adequately. At this point, we've got it situated. We've got that uh, enamic material bonded to either the, um, the base, the titanium abutment, or we've got that crown, the final crown, is on that base as well. If it's a final crown for a screw retain, all you do is come back and you polish it up. You make sure that access chimney is free of material. If you're doing an abutment for cement, now you have to add acid etch a secondary component, which is the enamic. So you then etch it, you fill up that uh, screw channel, then you would uh, etch it just like you did before, and then come back and you would cement your final crown over it after you've etched and sidelined into that as well. So it, it looks like a lengthy process, but once you get going and, and we can help you from here or uh, Emerald can help you out, or if you have any questions, certainly get a hold of the uh, manufacturer and we can uh, you know, help you out and get you going, make sure you're on the right process. Uh, again, this video, this webinar is gonna be uh, recorded so you can always go back and visit it. What we ha do have to do, whether it's cement retain 
or screw retaining, you have to learn how to block out that chimney, that access hole, especially for screw retain. You don't want food debris. Uh, throughout the years, I used to work for implant companies uh, in my career. Uh, it has gone from using the impergum material to fill up that chimney and then add some uh, composite on the top to gauze, to um, uh, tape, uh, uh, Teflon tape, right? The gauze kind of, if it absorbs uh, uh, fluid, same thing that's going to absorb fluid, you know, that's going to start smelling after a while. So you want to fill it up and block out that access channel with something that's not gonna absorb fluids and uh, cause an issue. You wanna make sure that on this screw access hole, when you're covering these up, you make sure that you etch the very superior area of the hole, the chimney. So that way when you add a composite to it, the composite will stick. So whatever in between the full length of that chimney, whatever you wanna, Put as fill material that you feel is adequate that's great and then on top of that you want to etch that superior area of the hole and then you want to go ahead and uh, use a composite that blends in with that tooth so that you don't even see the access hole it just gets absorbed through cosmetically and once you place it let's say I'm placing it and or I've Put it on my lab bench and I looked at it, I milled it, I created it. Hey, there's a, a space, there's a gap. Um, what do I do? How do I fill that out? What if I have a interdental uh, space there in my contact point that I've got to fill? The great thing about this material is that it is easily repaired if you want to. So whether it's a screw access channel or a contact area, all you have to do is use a composite and you can light cure it directly to the enamic and it is as strong as the material itself. So the bond, if it's done properly, uh, the testing that we, data that we show is that there's never an adhesive failure with this, it's cohesive. So uh, the bond between the composite and the enamic material is the same. So we can just use a light cured material and repair things. We can also create, uh, go to the extreme and go to different types of material with this dynamic material, right? So if you're doing a hybrid, if you're doing a fixed detachable, if you're doing a fixed um, denture, a fixed uh, ceramic, this happens to be a, a PEC material uh, that is milled out with ideal preparations. And then individually, all the teeth are milled out using the enamic material, and then they're bonded positioned to that framework. So that is uh, a lar how to get away with doing a large case and still having this force absorbing material. There may be cases if you if it's not treatment plan correctly, or often maybe sometimes that tissue dies back. The patients don't heal as well. Maybe we violated some of that uh, biological uh, zone, biological uh, width zone uh, for hard and soft tissue. And you've got all of a sudden situations in which you have necks of the teeth above the, the superior to the gingiva. So sometimes you actually have to use uh, pink porcelain to block out that area. Or in this case of anamic, because it's never fired, you use a pink composite and just add back to that restoration uh, to create um, a soft tissue look and or develop soft tissue contours. So you can use actually, uh, I think Mark mentioned earlier, a, a, a material called CAD temp that can be used for provisional material to develop your soft tissue contouring, your emergence profile to make it look well, see how that tissue, that soft tissue is healing and then come back and do your permanent. So this is a very ideal way uh, to create nice emergence profiles, make sure it's healed, see if you have to, down the road, have to add for your permanent, find out if you have to add some gingiva color to it. Maybe you have to reestablish bite. The, again, the thing about anamic is that if you need to, you can add to the occlusion uh, straight on that abutment material. But either way, the anamic is very versatile. Uh, it can be created, anterior aesthetics, if it need be, you can add some pink 
composite material. It polishes up nice, just like the uh, the enamic does. Uh, and again, it's uh, just a matter of how you're trying to treat it, what you need to do. Because this is not fired with conventional ceramic stains, you use a stain that is light cured if you need to characterize it. No problem. Uh, we have one that is available. Uh, it's just a light cured, uh, it's that called accent light cured. It's a universal light cured material and glaze that goes on various materials, composites as well. They come in different colors, uh, different tones and so forth. So if you need to manipulate something, uh, you certainly can. Otherwise, uh, you know, if not, once you've adjusted this material, if you've had to adjust it, just polish it. When it comes to implants, again, they're very static. The implants are not going to move on you, right? The material will absorb, but ideally, when the patient closes, comes in the centric, the, any adjacent natural dentition on that quadrant, on that side, they have to push in, they have to go into that secondary tooth movement, they have to relieve the pressure before centric occurs on your implant restorative material. Otherwise, those implants are going to take all of the loads, and that's something we don't want to see. So we usually don't leave it in centric contact. We remove a little bit, uh, 20, 50 microns. This is always debatable on, on the amount. It depends on that specific patient, how much movement you have, and what we have to um, adjust for. If you need to polish it, you can do it interorally or extraorally. Uh, there are some polishers. It's very light mode, a, a light touch to it, and very slow RPM when you uh, polish this. But the material itself, the enamic, it's, a, it's a, really a perfect material for uh, an implant restorative solution because it absorbs those um, loads. And so this is something you really should start considering about your implant crowns, individual crowns, if you're looking for long-term, whatever we can do to alleviate stresses, absorb those loads, especially on those patients that are heavy biters, uh, we need to have the material that we select uh, a little bit more working for that patient, for that long-term success, and have a material that's very healthy for the patient for long-term as well. Uh, if you... One, I kind of went over this, but enamic itself, you know, it has to be uh, adhesively bonded. You cannot use conventional cementation. We have other materials that you can, uh, but as far as the enamic goes, it must be adhesively uh, bonded. And then I went over the, uh, the hybrid abutment material cement that you would use over those implant abutments. If you need to get hold of us here at Vita North America, uh, please do so. This is the information that uh, you can use to contact us. We have a help desk. We have a Canadian uh, phone number, toll-free, as, as well as a U.S.-based one. Um, Paul is my colleague here, uh, so you can either email him, you can email the help desk, or myself. That is my information, my direct phone line here at the office. We are going to be out of uh, for Thanksgiving, U.S. Thanksgiving, so um, I won't be in the office tomorrow or Friday. I'll be back in the office Monday. It's our Thanksgiving uh, weekend. Uh, and then if you want to get a hold of your local Canadian rep, whether you're a lab or a dentist, here's uh, the information for, the, for Canada, the different uh, um, reps that we have in different uh, provinces. Uh, please do so. Please get a hold of us. Uh, or, or get a hold of your rep. And then you can also find us here on our Vita social media outlets. Uh, we have a, a plethora of videos, of webinars on our YouTube Vita North America website. Please visit us and see what else we have. We, we go over stain glaze, characterization, everything. If you need to get a hold of someone from the uh, dental lab services or the Emerald Dental Works, uh, please do so. Uh, that's their information, and so just, you know, please uh, reach out. Uh, let us know what we can do to help you, whether or not you're, um, you know, us, uh, Emerald, uh, whether it's about uh, getting the materials, purchasing equipment to mill yourself, 
where there's types of services. Um, you know, any questions, we would we'll be happy to help you out as we can. Um, so, Mark, I think this is uh, pretty much uh, okay. it. Okay. Uh, and, thank you. Thank you so much for this for the for the uh, presentation. Um, I don't know. I I don't see the questions, but I'm sure. I don't know if there is. Yeah, I got that. that. Yeah, I do have one. If you want me, to, unless you have sure. some questions first. Well, I'll and let then you we ask can... that one so we don't repeat it. Uh, there's a question about when adding composite to the interproximal contact points for implant supported crowns. What are your thoughts on the affecting the path of removal for screw retained crowns? So, this is a it's a good question when it comes to implants because we kind of forget general dentistry in a sense sometimes, and this is true for the labs as well, right? We as lab technicians have to be comfortable to contact our dentists and say, hey, I had to adjust the proximal contact of a natural tooth so that the path of insertion is good and conducive with my adjacent contact points. So just like a natural tooth, uh, a prep, a, um, you know, a crown for a natural tooth, on an implant case, because that's static, because that implant is not going to move any, we have to make sure that those approximal contact points are about the same par in the parallel to the abutment post. That is uh, the best way to do that, and then that way you don't have point contacts at the end. And, you know, you can make it just so that the uh, patient can still floss, still have contact, and everything works out nice. Okay, Jim, I, I have a question. Um, just regarding the uh, minimal thickness of the Vita and Namek, um, when you're milling that, um, you're and you're cementing over the hybrid, what's the minimal thickness to block out that hybrid? Realizing that the uh, cement that, or the, the cement that you used, it was a uh, opacious cement from uh, Ivoclar, but um, is, there, is there parameters that you have to follow for that? Yeah, so when we're talking about a posterior that is gonna uh, have a lot of loads, heavy loads, um, the material itself, the Thickness of the material has to be a minimum of one millimeter. Okay. That's what we are Health Canada approved for. So I took it out, but I mean, I can show you clinical cases in which the dentist went ahead and polished this material down to two tenths of a millimeter. And since 2013, it is, is still in situ and the patient is still eating healthy and and it's and it, it's, they're still bonded with no issue but clinically for regulation for health canada and us one millimeter thickness and then of course you, as i think you were talking about you have to make sure that they um are uh, prepping accordingly so you have to have an adhesive gap right and that's changed Throughout the years as well, you see when I first started with implants, it was a 100 uh, micron gap for cement, for bonding cement. It's much thinner now. Now we're talking about 20, 30 microns uh, with the newer generation bonding cement. So, Okay, Jim, uh, look, at seeing that it's 10 after 8, um, our time, um, I, I, we can, we'll just uh, cut it there. If anybody has any questions, um, they can forward it to me and of course forward it to Jim or, or the whole Vita team. Um, again, uh, Jim, thank you for this and I really appreciate it. And um, and for continuing education points, those will be sent out or point, those would be sent out at a later date or do we, or how do they take care of that? Yeah, so the CE uh, for Canada, we do uh, letters of CE of ours. Okay. Uh, we do have your information uh, as you registered, so give us a couple of days. Our education marketing department will go through that list, and then we will start uh, sending out those letters. Um, Mark, I'll send you a final copy as well. Okay, great. And so that you have it, and in case we miss someone, please feel free to get a hold of us, uh, get a hold of Mark, get a hold of myself. And just let me know, let us know that you're still missing some C and we will take care of that.
Okay, so uh, thank you everybody for uh, sticking around and, and uh, taking in this lecture on a Wednesday night. Um, if there are any topics that you want us to talk about in future presentations, please let us know and um, we'll see if we can accommodate you. So um, Jim, yep. thank you Excellent. so much and uh, have a great Thanksgiving and everybody up here in Canada and enjoy your Wednesday night. Take care. Thank you. So this will, this will concludes today's uh, webinar.